Hello everyone, welcome to NHM Live here at the Natural History Museum in London. My name is Camilla and I'll be your host for today's show. Now, as the name implies, we are broadcasting live right now, which means not only do I have to try really hard not to say anything completely ridiculous because I can't take it back, but it's also your chance to speak to us directly. So we want to hear from you. Say hi, tell us where you're watching from, but most importantly, send your questions through. I'm going to be joined by two lovely scientists in just a few minutes' time, and they're really keen to hear from you. So send your questions through, don't be shy. So today we're going to be taking you behind the scenes. We'll be showing you a small live dissection. It's nothing super gory, don't worry about that. Uh, and we are also going to be revealing a mystery specimen. But before we crack on with all of that, let's catch up on the latest science news with Josh, da Josh Davis. <laughs> Hello, we start this week with one of the most mysterious objects in the entire universe as scientists revealed the first ever image of a black hole. The object itself is unseeable as the immense gravitational force means that no light or matter can escape its clutches, but researchers using the Event Horizon Telescope Network have been able to picture the halo of dust and gas that trace the outline of a black hole that sits in the middle of a galaxy known as Messier 87. Located 55 million light years from Earth, the object is 6.5 billion times more massive than the Sun and marks a breakthrough in our understanding of the weird environment that surrounds black holes where all known physical laws collapse. We can also welcome a new member to the human family tree after scientists working in the Philippines have announced the discovery of a new species of ancient human. Based on 13 teeth and bones found in a cave, the new species has been named Homo luzonensis after the island of Luzon on which they lived. The remains are thought to date to 67,000 years ago and raise many intriguing questions about the seafaring ability of early humans, as Luzon has never been attached to the Asian mainland. Not only that, but the size of the teeth suggests that H. luzonensis may have been small in stature, echoing the diminutive Homo floresiensis from Indonesia. And finally, in the coastal deserts of Peru, scientists have uncovered fossil remains of an ancient otter-like creature. With four limbs, webbed feet and hooves at the end of its toes, the fossils are thought to be of an early whale that lived in the coastal region over 42 million years ago. With four legs and a powerful tail, the early whale would have moved easily on land, whilst also being able to hunt efficiently under the water. The finding shows that the semi-aquatic ancestors to the largest animals on the planet dispersed rapidly from the Asian subcontinent where they evolved and colonized much of the world within just a few million years. Now, back to the studio with Camilla. <music> So if you caught last month's episode of NHM Live, and why wouldn't you have watched it, Josh made reference uh, to a very cool expedition way out in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean that some of our museum scientists participated in. And I have one of those intrepid scientists here with me today, John Ablett. John, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. So tell us a bit about where you've been, because you've literally been out in the middle of the ocean for about a month or so, and you only actually came back, what, a week or 10 days ago? Yeah, last Monday. Okay, so where exactly were you and, and what were you doing? So we were sampling in the waters around Tristan da Cunha and St Helena. And these are two uh, of the UK's overseas territories. And they're pretty much slap bang in the middle of the South Atlantic. In fact, Tristan da Cunha is the uh, most remote permanently habited island in the world. So yeah, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. And the aim of it was, uh, it was part of uh, Operation Blue Belt, which is a uh, foreign office funded project. And it's kind of to look at the biodiversity around the islands. And one of the original reasons for this is because both of these islands are heavily reliant on fishing 
uh, as part of their economy. And this trip was to look at the biodiversity of the species that are fished for, the food webs around that, so the kind of things that the fish that they catch to sell eat, and the things that they eat in turn. And in turn, just to look at the general biodiversity and the health of these areas so that we can make the, or help to make the, the fishing sustainable uh, for the future. Right, so it was the NHM, CFAS, and uh, the British, British, British Antarctic, Antarctic Survey. Survey. And this, this part of the world was not a lot known before this expedition in terms of the, the marine life around these islands? No, I mean, there'd been expeditions to these regions in the past. Looking through our museum records, there were some from um, Challenger, so the Challenger expedition uh, stopped there. Um, there was a big Norwegian expedition in the 1930s and a few other throughout the, the last 100 years, but no, very little um, was known about the waters of these regions. OK, so very exciting time to be going. And you, you did sample a lot. Uh, how many, roughly how many specimens? Ooh, I think when I left, um, they were over 2,000, and now I think they're, they're way over 3,000 samples collected. So, okay, and yeah. will they be coming to our museum collections? Or? They will, the majority will be coming back to the museum. So the boat is currently on its way to Namibia, and then it'll be stopping off in Southampton, and yet yeah, all the material hopefully will be coming here to the museum. Nice, very good. Okay, so tell us about some of the marine life that you found in these samples, and, and how, how deep down did you sample? So we were fishing from the surface waters down to just over 1,000 metres. And we were, were trawling, at least the work I was doing was trawling, uh, these RMT trawls, these midwater trawls. So you're basically dropping a net down, uh, you can set what depth it opens and what depth it closes. So you can do these targeted trawls. So you can say, OK, between this depth and this depth, this is a snapshot of the, the life that you find there. And we were finding some really amazing squid, octopus, uh, fish, crustaceans, salps, jellyfish, um, the whole range of things. It was, yeah, it was absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, this was my first marine collecting trip, and yeah, I'm hooked. It was amazing. Do you think you'll get invited back for another one? Fingers okay, crossed. Too good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So you are particularly interested in cephalopods, uh, so things like um, octopus, um, squid, cuttlefish. Were there any particularly interesting finds uh, in, in terms of, of cephalopods, maybe new, new to science or new to our collections? Yeah, so one which wasn't particularly new to science, but one that I loved was Histiotuthis, um, sometimes called the jeweled squid or the cockeye squid, and these were quite common in our trawls, but they're absolutely stunning, really, really beautiful animals. And one of the things that I loved about this trip was I'm so used to seeing specimens here in the museum, um, they might be hundreds of years old, the colours often faded, the features may be slightly damaged, they weren't collected in, in a, as good condition as they would be today. So to see things fresh, to see them sparkling, to see the skin nice and fresh was really, really amazing. And, and creatures like this, the jewel squid, are absolutely beautiful, covered in photophores, light emitting organs, this beautiful deep red skin. Uh, and the thing I love about these is the eyes. Uh, one of their common names is the cockeye squid. So they have one kind of normal squid eye and the other uh, like this kind of tubular uh, eye, a bit like a kind of um, a telescope sticking out. And they're perfectly evolved for lying on their side. Uh, one eye can look up, the tubular eye looks up, looking at um, possible prey items above them. And the other eye looks down, uh, looking for uh, the bioluminescent uh, light produced by animals that may want to eat them, so possible predators as well. So two different eyes, both wow. adapted for different environments. So it spends the majority of its time just on its side like that, and that's caused that incredible adaptation. Exactly. Amazing. Uh, so we've had a question come through on uh, Facebook from Natasha. What was the oddest animal you found, and were there many new species? So we're not quite sure if we found some new species. We've definitely found some interesting things, <laughs> um, things that don't quite look like um, the representatives that we know about. Um, the problem is that lots of species from this area of the world are poorly known, so we right. might have examples of them. So when we find something slightly different, we don't know if it's a new species or if it's a more mature form or a more juvenile form or just a regional variation. So what we'll do is we'll bring these specimens back to the museum collections, we'll compare them with material we have here, we'll possibly um, ask to borrow material from other institutions that house similar material, and then we can get a better idea of if we've got new species or not. Yeah, it does take a bit of, quite a bit of work right, to be able to say we've definitely got a new species. Yeah. And you were talking to me earlier about a quite an unusual looking, ah, I can't remember if it's an octopus or a squid, it's quite gelatinous. Ah, looking. yeah. Uh, so the Amphitritis telei. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so one of the things that I loved about this trip was seeing animals that I've never even heard of, let alone seen. <laughs> and this was one, uh, we don't have any specimens in the uh, collection, but this is a deep sea uh, glass-like octopus, uh, very gelatinous. Um, really rare, really unusual. Um, they're the only group of octopus to have these tubular eyes. So they have a kind of tubular, tubular eye structure. Um, 
So as soon as you see the eye structure, you know exactly uh, what group of animals it belongs to. So yeah, seeing these unusual, um, less common things was yeah, was absolutely amazing. And that's exciting, right? Because we, as you say, we don't have any in the collection, so that'll be a new addition, which is which is great. We've got another question through from Esther on Facebook. So Esther's wondering whether you saw uh, much plastic pollution in the environment. Did you pull up a lot of a lot of plastic? No, uh, we didn't. Uh, thankfully, I didn't actually see in any of the plastic nets we were doing. Didn't see any plastic pollution, um, which is yeah, which is great. Okay, that's that's. that's good. <laughs> I'm really glad that was your answer. That could have taken quite a sad turn. Um, so that's good to hear. Uh, and I know it's not your particular <laughs> area of interest or expertise, but I have been following your your colleague James McLean, who's one of our senior fish curators here on Twitter, and he's just been relentlessly posting these incredible pictures of the fish that he's been pulling up. I know you know a bit about fish. So tell us about some of the particularly exciting or, or interesting finds in terms yeah. of the fish from the trawls. Yeah, I'm not a fish researcher, but you cannot help but be captivated by the the pictures of him that he was sending back. Um, things like Sloan's viper fish, um, these kind of strange deep, teeth, uh, deep sea, very toothy uh, fish, and they have a barbel uh, with a, a light organ on the end. I mean, these were just fantastic. And again, they're in much better condition than most of the equivalent material that we have here already at the museum. And are they, are they so things like the Sloan viper fish, um, and there were some dragon fish as well, are they from quite, are they quite deep down? Those ones? Yeah, so we didn't deep much further than a thousand metres. So, I mean, this is still, you know, a thousand metres is where you don't get any natural light. So these are deep water animals where there's very, very low to no light levels as well. I mean, this, I believe, is a, an obese dragonfish. And, Seems um, a bit cruel. Well, I mean, it's kind of fair at the same time. but And it's huge. It's much larger than um, the known records. Um, quite a bit larger. I can't remember exactly. And uh, when I was talking to James, our fish curator, he said the only other representative of this species we have in our collection is the type. So the, the specimen that um, this species was based on, the original voucher species. Right. And that was collected on the Challenger voyage in the 1870s. So We've got that specimen and this specimen, so we've doubled our holdings. That's great stuff. And I am going to make you talk about just one more <laughs> specimen because it had really unusual kind of swivelly eyes. I can't remember the scientific name. I think it's a swivel-eyed fish. Yep, we'll call it no, swivel-eyed swivel fish. fish yeah. So this is absolutely amazing. And um, that was one of the things, when you pull, pull something amazing out of the water, everyone would stop and just come and have <laughs> a look. You, you can't help it. If you, you, you know, you're interested in science, natural history, you just have a look. And uh, James... Um, filmed, as you can see here, uh, this, these eyes actually moving, these rotating through sort of uh, 90 degrees or so. And he sent it to um, some colleagues um, at another institution that work on this species. And it's long been suspected, but this is the first time it's ever actually been seen. So the first time it's been proved that this happened. So uh, we got, although we might not have found new species, we found new things about species that we, that we didn't know before. Great stuff. So let's take another question on Facebook. Um, Oh, we've got, okay, so we've got some viewers saying that they'd love to be involved in an expedition like this. Sure, I can understand that. Um, how might they go about doing that? <laughs> Are you the way in, maybe? We need to be pals with you. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, I was invited as part of the museum to help preserve the material, to help um, get it into a good state, to bring it back and to provide my uh, expertise in identifying things. So it was a real honour to be invited and something I, I hope to do again. So hide in your suitcase, I think, is the answer. That is definitely that. the answer. Um, so just as a, kind of, as a kind of final question um, in relation to expeditions like this, you know, we have one of the largest natural history collections in the world. Um, why do you think it's important to keep, keep expanding the collection with, with new things all the time? So a collection uh, of animals, a, a jar of animals, is only ever a snapshot of one species from one place and one time. If we want to study species change through time, if we want to study uh, species change geographically, um, you know, are, are things bigger in the north than they are in the south? Um, with, with things like fishing, when people say, oh, cod were this big X number of years ago, and now they're only this big. How do you know? Well, we've got time series in museums. So we need to um, not only look for new species, but to build upon the representatives that we have here in the museum in order to ask the best scientific questions that we can. Great stuff. Well, you've done a great job of doing that. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Do stick around. Will and do. John is going to be here for a few more minutes, so do send your questions through. Keep him on his toes. Uh, if you've been following the museum's usual social media channels, you might have seen a couple of posts recently that have kind of been leading, teasing uh, videos with relation to a mystery specimen that we're going to be revealing a little bit later on in the show. We've got one more teaser video to show you, so pay close attention and send your guesses on through. <laughs>
That is a really obscure one. I have absolutely no idea what that was. Do you have any clue what that might have been? No idea. You know, any, any guesses whatsoever? <sighs> Dinosaur-y, maybe? Uh, you stick to Kefla <laughs> <you. laughs> So uh, John is one of many curators here at the museum, and they are working tirelessly to look after all of our collections, to make them accessible to scientists both inside and outside of the museum all over the world and occasionally they also get to cut stuff open. Alison is with one of our other curators right now who has one of the coolest scientist names, Jeff Stryker. She's with him right now and they're about to open up a specimen so we can take a peek inside. Let's have a look. Thank you, Camilla. Yep, I'm joined in the studio by Jeff, who long-term viewers of the show might recognise from previous episodes. But Jeff, just remind us what you do at the museum. Sure. So I'm a curator in the herpetology group. That's amphibians and reptiles. And so, as Camilla was mentioning, I help take care of the collection, but I also give access to scientists from all over the world to the, to the collection, and also help with training the next generation of scientists that are going to be using collections like ours here. And you do, um, as Camilla mentioned, get a chance to uh, see inside our specimens sometimes, don't From you? From time to time I do, yeah, that's correct. So we're going to do a little bit of dissection work today. Um, so what specimen have you got with, with us? So I've selected a particular species of toad to show, us, to show our audience here today. And viewers may actually be familiar with this species already. This is something called a marine toad or a cane toad. Okay. It has been introduced in several places in the world. It's native to North America and South America. And you can already see from its size that uh, it, it's quite a voracious eater. Um, it, it has to eat a lot to get to this size. And unlike a lot of toads that people may have seen before, this species has particularly large paratoid glands, so these very large poison glands that kind of characterize most of the members of this family. Wow, poison so glands. I picked this one because this is, I think, a specimen we're very likely to see some interesting food items in, given how they'll eat just about anything. Fantastic. So we're going to open up this specimen. If you could right. talk us through okay. um, what you're doing. So That'd ahead of the great. broadcast, I've made a small incision already, just here on the side of the, the ventral surface of the animal. So you can see what I did was I just cut open here using these scissors. I cut open into the body cavity, and so I had to go through a couple layers of tissue, and I've now exposed this main area of the body cavity so that I can see the stomach. As a curator, I've tried to be careful to make a small incision so that most of the specimen's not damaged. I was going to say, it's and very small. That's, that's deliberate then. And I, I've done it deliberately so it's just on the side of the toad that I know the stomach is on. Um, so I'm actually, this is the muscle that forms the lining of the stomach, and I've also made a small incision into that. So now I'm now oh. pinching the tissue of the stomach lining and the skin together, and this hole is now an opening into the stomach. Okay? So I'm going to put these forceps in and see if we can't find any food items. You have to give me a moment. We don't know <laughs> if this... A little poke around in there, yeah. see if you can feel anything. See. Well, see there's anything? a little something. That's oh. not too interesting, but some digested arthropod, perhaps. Okay. Let's see if there's anything a little bit larger in here. Uh, ooh, well, that's oh, that's something. Whoa. Well, so I'm not an entomologist, but I know that <laughs> these toads eat a lot of different insects. I'm pretty sure that's a, a piece of a beetle carapace. Do they yeah. chew their food at all? That's a, that's a big chunk. That's an excellent question. They actually don't chew their food. They swallow it whole. Um, and they, they, Frogs and toads do something quite interesting where they have to actually use their eyes to help them kind of push their food towards their esophagus and then the muscles of the esophagus help it move down. So that's something they do, they, how they eat their food a bit differently than we do. Yeah. It's, it's fantastic to, to see this in action and, and to see this uh, particular specimen yeah. here. So is it normal that we would do this type of dissection? Is that a normal part of the job? It, it depends on what our questions are. I would say if we need to determine something about where the animal's from, this is an mm -hmm. excellent way to do it. Um, also, we may be interested in uh, knowing a little bit more about the biology of the species. This may be a species that's poorly known to science, like John was mentioning about some of their uh, rarely encountered species they found on their expedition. So this may be one way for us to find out what a poorly known species is eating that tells us a little bit about what part of the food web it belongs to. And in fact, looking at a, a specimen's last meal can yeah. be extremely revealing, can't it? It can be, yeah. It even uh, helped you solve a uh, hundred-year-old mystery quite recently. Why so it has, yes. We'll be finding out a little bit about the, that in just a moment. We're 
whiskers are particularly important for small, nocturnal, arboreal mammals. They use them for foraging, so finding and identifying food, and for getting themselves around their complicated habitats. The dormouse can move their whiskers in a process that is called whisking, so backwards and forwards cyclic movements, some of the fastest movements that mammals can make. They can move their whiskers because they've got special muscles, and these special muscles are preserved from marsupials to even primates. So that makes us think that the first mammals would have also had movable whiskers as well. So he's joining us now. He's got a very cool name, Jeff Stryker. John, you've got a great name as well, but Jeff Stryker, okay. come on. Sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jeff, thank you so much for doing that dissection and letting us look inside. No problem, my pleasure. That's specimen. And you very kindly brought along another jar of uh, quite sort of old looking, well, the labels certainly look old and historical specimens yeah. here. Um, and there's a really interesting story behind these specimens and they were uh, the source of a lot of mystery for, for curators here at the museum for a long time. Can you tell us that story? Yeah, they were absolutely. And uh, so these, these toads are are quite old. They're actually, they were first registered at the British Museum in 1858. And as many types of anim animals that were from all over the world were at that time, they were, they were very different compared to what the researchers at the museum had seen before. And so they were de designated as a new species. And without getting too much into the weeds of taxonomy and how we apply names to different um, branches of the tree of life, I will say that these are type specimens, and so these became the name-bearing specimens for this particular species, which means they're the reference material that scientists use to compare to all other things like them to determine what are new species, what are single species, things like that. And so these, species, these toads that were collected 150 years ago, not too much was, you know, it was, okay, great, new species to science, moving on, describing more diversity and things like that. But once we knew, you know, fast forward about 100 years, we knew a little bit more about toad diversity around the world. Looking back at these specimens, when we were comparing them to new species, we found out that where they're supposed to be from doesn't make a lot of sense. Right, so, so where does it say that they're from? So it actually says that these toads are from Guayaquil and the Andes in Ecuador. So I don't know if you're familiar with the country of Ecuador. Sadly, I am not. So uh, oh, we have a map. Lovely. Oh. <laughs> uh, so e Ecuador in South America down here, uh, there are two places that are listed on the toad jar. One is called Guayaquil, and the other is the Andes. So the Andes, many of the viewers have heard of, I'm sure, the tall mountains in South America. Guayaquil is like a, a low coastal town. So these are very different places that you don't normally see a single species of toad living in. So that made this quite a bit of a mystery of how these toads could be from both of these places. but. Not that big a deal, except that we didn't know that we, we did not observe any toads that looked like this from Ecuador, despite most toads that look like this being very conspicuous, not being difficult to find. They normally sit out in the open when they're foraging and things like that. So that, that felt that raised the first question. That, that was the, kind of unusual. That's right. That was a bit unusual. And also, we had been learning a little bit more about toads from Mexico as a scientific community. And there was a toad from Mexico that looked just like these toads. <laughs> And we started learning, thinking more about what these, who collected these toads, how they were collected. And the individual that collected them, Mr. Louis Frazier, actually did an entire trip that spanned South America up through Mexico into the United States. And so we wondered, is it possible that this jar could have been mislabeled? How, I mean, as a curator, well, both, both of you as curators, how often does that question kind of run through your minds, that, that some of the labels, they just one or two of them occasionally, they might be incorrect. I mean, especially something that was so, so long right. ago, maybe collecting practices or, or labelling practices, whatever it might be, right. was slightly different back then. Was that, was that an unusual thing to think about, to contemplate? I'm going to let John go first. <laughs> um, from fi just knowing fieldwork, you know, when you're collecting lots of specimens, it can be sometimes quite hard to keep track of your data. You have to make a real effort and mistakes do happen. Um, and especially um, with older collection data sets, you know, there was maybe less emphasis on getting really exact collection data. So you might have somewhere very general, like this was collected in China or this was collected in the right. Southern Ocean. So, you know, really right. not as precise as we collect nowadays. Yeah. Sure, absolutely. And at that time, when these particular toads arrived, the, the curator, uh, Albert Gunther, was getting material from all over the world, right? And so he had rooms filled with toads and snakes and lizards and fishes as well. He was also responsible for those. So you can imagine that amongst that, although they kept meticulous notes and did a great job, every once in a while, there might have been a mistake. 
Okay, so t tell us about how, how yourself and your colleagues came into play here. So, so for the longest time, this toad was just, you know, it was labelled as being from these yeah. two places in Ecuador, and people thought, mm, that's kind of odd, but we can't say anything otherwise. Yeah. So until, I guess, you came along. So, uh, yeah, well, it was actually uh, the, a, an email from one of my former collaborators in the, in the U.S. that had emailed me shortly after I arrived at the museum. Joe Mendelson emailed me, and he said, oh, there's Joe. Hi, Joe. Uh, <laughs> and he, he informed me that the, he, he always was curious about these type of specimens because because of their morphology, what their physical features are, we always suspected that they were mislabeled and that these are actually this species from Mexico that is very common and very well known. So as scientists, we thought, well, we need multiple lines of evidence to try and determine where these frogs are from because one line of evidence, the label on the jar, seems to be inconsistent with what the physical features of the animal say. So I noticed that one of the toads had an incision on its stomach and sticking out of the, uh, on, its, on the underside, just like we saw with Allison a moment ago, mm -hmm. and sticking out of its stomach was the leg of what I didn't know then, but turned out to be a beetle. And so I went through the stomach and carefully removed the following beetles from the stomach of one of these type specimens. And I was looking at these beetles, and as I previously mentioned, I'm not an entomologist, so I thought, wow, those beetles are all different from one another. Uh, good last meal, yeah. yeah. That, but I, I, was, I didn't have the expertise to actually identify where these beetles, uh, what these beetles were, where they came from. And then I thought to myself, wait a minute, I'm working at the Natural History Museum. I'm glad I, that realization. And I had this, this realization as, as a young curator, I realized <laughs> I have this incredible opportunity to take advantage of the expertise that are, is within these walls and walk down the corridor with my plate of beetles to our coleopterists. Those are beetle specialists. Uh, this wonderful team of Look coleopterists here, within an hour, had identified almost all of those beetles you just saw on the previous plate. And they were able to tell me with pretty high certainty that almost all of those beetles came from Mesoamerica, which is kind of, that's much further north than Ecuador is. And the one that got a little far south only went as far south as Costa Rica which you probably remember from the map is a bit further north than Ecuador. So because there were so many beetles, that really gave us a bit more confidence that as the morphology was suggesting, these toads were actually mislabeled and probably collected by Fraser in Mexico in the 1800s. Okay, so that obviously shows, well, really highlights the value of having such an extensive, you know, beetle collection, but also to have all kinds of experts yeah. under one roof. And it shows that it does pay off to poke around inside stomachs. Sometimes. Absolutely, and the, yeah, there's, there's Incilius occidentalis, the, uh, uh, the toad species that these are referable to. Yeah. Uh, do you do a lot of dissection yourself, John? Or yeah, um, slugs, snails, squid and octopus, yeah. Sometimes really look like at stomach stuff. contents as well, so yeah, yeah. always love it. In fact, the very, the very first episode of NHM Live, I'm sure you dissected a squid. I did. And that was the first time I learned that squids Whoa. have three hearts because they have a lot of love to give. Well, why do they have, why <laughs> well, do they have three hearts? The, each of the gills, they have two gills, has a heart, and they have a central uh, systemic heart which to, to pump the blood around the body. Nice, thank you. That's better than my explanation. Uh, so we've had uh, a question from Mark. Uh, how do museums preserve specimens long term? Is, is, is that the best way to preserve specimens long term? Sure, well, I think it, it depends on the type of specimen. Right. So for certain types of organisms like plants and insects, we preserve them dry, right? Which is a different preparation methodology than what you're seeing with the vertebrate animals and so some of the inverts that John works with as well, where we preserve them in spirit or alcohol, is another way to call that. Um, and, and nowadays, we actually do, prior to preserving them in the alcohol, we'll do a, a fixation process where they're actually exposed to a dilute formaldehyde solution as well, which keeps some of the physical features um, closer to the, as they are in life for a, a very long time. Excellent, thank you. And um, we're, we've got one more question uh, for Jeff from Victor on Facebook. Is there any other famous case, I'm putting you on the spot here. No, that's all right. Is there any other famous case <laughs> all <right>, of, Victor. <laughs> <laughs> of mislabeling that you can remember? Um, there are, so I, I, I did not know this before we worked on this project, but the, th there have been two, I think it's two, species of beetle that have been described on the basis of finding beetles in toad stomachs. So toads are great beetle collectors, just yeah. like people. Uh, and I, I do know that's happened. For famous mislabelings, uh, at least in herpetology, nothing's coming to mind that kind of uh, has a you know, similar type of story. Do you know of any, John? I'm currently working on actually a snail that might have been less labeled, a similar thing type, maybe from the wrong locality. So yeah, I think it, it does happen with these, slightly, these older collections with the very vague um, locality data. 
Great stuff. Great, great question, Victor. Thank you very much. Um, so, Jeff, we are you happy to stick around as well, I'm, I'm, yep. and uh, hopefully we'll be getting some more questions through for the both of you. So now we always like to show you behind the scenes parts of the museum here, and I think it's fair to say that plants don't really get a fair shake. Everyone seems to get excited about other aspects of the wild world, when actually plants are essential for pretty much all other life on Earth. Well, a few days ago, uh, one of our curators in botany, Fred Rumsey, took us behind the scenes into the herbarium and showed us some pressed plant specimens, but not just any pressed plants, carnivorous plants. Let's take a look. Hi, I'm Fred Rumsey. I'm one of the botanical curators here at the Natural History Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you behind the scenes today to see some of my favorite specimens, the pressed carnivorous plants. So let's go and see him, shall we? So this is one of my favourite carnivorous plants. This is a North American pitcher plant, Saracenia. I really like it. It's, it's such an attractive thing. It's got these lovely flowers, which are such a bizarre umbrella-like shape, and the most amazing colourful pitchers. And it catches its insect prey by having a very simple mechanism. It's, it's just a, a pitfall trap. So they just fall in to the liquid, which are in these lovely pitchers, and they get digested there. I guess that too many people really like these plants in this country. They put them out in bogs, in national nature reserves, in special places, and they do too well. They eat pollinators, they outcompete our native plants, and really, I want to encourage people to, to put these plants into, into the wild, keep them in gardens and enjoy them there. I'm just looking at Charles Darwin's first study of insectivorous plants, published in 1875. And he was fascinated by this particular plant, sundew. About two thirds of the book is made up of his experiments looking at this plant, which grew near his home in Kent. It's actually the commonest British insectivorous plant, and it can be found across most of the British Isles. It's rather more active than the, the, the pitfall trap of the, of the pitcher plant, in that each of the little leaves is covered with these sticky tentacles, and the insects will become sort of glued to them, and the tentacles then actually move. So the adjoining tentacles around will also close in to fasten on the thing that they've caught. And within that glue is the digestive enzymes which help break the plant down. We have a really nice specimen here. It's about as big as it gets. So it's not a big plant, but it's beautiful. And the name sundew just really captures its, its, it, the way it glistens in the light because of this sticky insect trapping glue that's there. People think of carnivorous plants as being really exotic and think they're not going to ever find them. But sometimes they're sort of hidden in plain sight. And this is, this is one example. It's a bladder wort. It's an aquatic plant. So it's actually spending its whole life underwater and it's trapping little water fleas. So unless you really look carefully at it, you'd never know that there was this amazing trapping technology going on in its leaves. It catches little insects. And I think it's one of those things that if you go out and look around the world, wherever you go, you'll find these rare examples of plants which catch animals and eat them. You could be in a jungle, you could be on a bog, a mountain somewhere. If you look hard enough, you'll find them. So I hope you've really enjoyed seeing some of our treasures here in the museum and we'll go out and try to find some yourself. Amazing stuff, uh, really great to see it. And I embarrassingly didn't actually know that we had carnivorous plants here in the UK. Did you know that? No. Oh, yeah. I just moved here. <laughs> that's a good, okay, <laughs> that's a good excuse. All right, so now uh, we've had some really interesting guesses through on social media with regards to our mystery specimen, which we're about to reveal, but let's have a look at some people's guesses. So uh, Jacob on Twitter thought from the early clip that it might be ambergris, which I think, I think that might be Wales. I think it might be whale vomit. I think it is. 
I don't, yeah. Okay. So that's an interesting. That's an interesting guess. Uh, Lee Grant thought it might be our Archaeopteryx fossil, which is a lovely guess as well. Steve, who's watching live uh, first, initially thought it might be the T-Rex skull in our gallery, but later he changed his mind once he spotted the teeth. So he said perhaps an iguanodon. Um, what do you What do you think? You get. You said some kind of dinosaur, didn't you, John? Was your guess? Yeah, it was my guess. Some yeah. kind of dinosaur. Is that enough? Can I say Ankylosaurus? That's my favourite. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. What about you? What vertebrate about you? animal. Vertebrate animal. Really narrowing that down. Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm so stumped. I don't know. <laughs> let's check out what the mystery specimen is. Wow, congratulations, it was a vertebrate animal. You must be well, very proud of yourself. Uh, yeah, right? except it was a triceratops. I should have known that one. You should have really, yeah, you really should have. should have known that one. So there you go, it was a triceratops. So that specimen is actually uh, a cast of a triceratops and it currently sits in the dinosaurs gallery here at the museum. And actually back in the 1930s, it was in Central Hall, which is now Hintzy Hall. Uh, so back then it was alongside uh, Dippy. A couple of facts about triceratops. I've had to write these down and I cannot remember them. So triceratops means three-horned face which seems obvious and makes total sense, was a herbivorous dinosaur living in the late Cretaceous, that's 68 to 66, roughly a million years ago, and could get up to nine metres long. Impressive stuff. OK, so we just have a couple of minutes left, but I really just want to get through some of these questions that people have been sending through because they're great. So there was a question for you, John. Did you get seasick on the expedition? Great question. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is my first time working at sea. Uh, I got seasick uh, twice. The first was our first day working. We hit a bit of bad weather. I mm. uh, just wasn't used to it. I had to go and make my excuses. Sure. Um, and then a bit later on, um, we hit a gale. Uh, and I, I, I wasn't sick, but yeah, I did not feel well. But you got, you got used to it after a while, which meant you could enjoy the delicious food that you enjoyed so exactly. much on board. <laughs> Excellent. OK, uh, there was another question up here. Um, again, for you, John. So um, Jolene's daughter would like to know, what is the smallest squid you have encountered? Oh, encounters. So in the collection, there are lots of larval squid, which could be you know, under a centimetre long, centimetre, two centimetres. So very, very small, very, very tricky to identify. Um, on our trip, we didn't get too many small ones, thankfully. Um, actually, one of the first ones we caught was a lovely little Abraeliopsis squid, um, which had lovely photophores around the eyes. Um, and yeah, that was really exciting. That wow. was one of the smaller ones, so you know. So how long was that, sorry? Did you uh, probably about three, four centimetres. So okay. not too small, but yeah. But yeah, we didn't catch anything really, really small on the trip. Okay, and how, how small does it get in the, in the world of, of herpetology, Jeff, when it comes to amphibians and reptiles? Uh, there are some very small amphibian species. W one species of frog, the pitcher plant frog, as, as John was saying, can be very small. Like we're talking about, you know, um, a few, you know, few millimeters kind of as, as adults. Oof, wow, yeah. okay. Yeah. And it's a pitcher plant frog, is that, so um, uh, Fred was showing us uh, a kind of response, which was a, a pitcher plant. Are they called pitcher plant frogs because they... That's right, because they they'll actually sit inside the pitcher plants. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. Amazing, great stuff. Yeah. Excellent questions. Okay, so I have a final question for the both of you, in yeah. fact. Maybe we can start with you, Jeff. All right. Um, and so that is, what's, what's the kind of coolest thing that's happened here or the coolest discovery that's been made since you've been working here at the museum? Oh, that's a tough <laughs> question. Um, well, I think it's really kind of the, 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 the sum of all of the discoveries. I think it's... This is every, a cop out answer, every day, isn't it? No, that it really totally is. is. I'm just trying to, you know, like, oh, we discovered a new species. Well, people discover new species all the time in the museum. Um, I thought, okay, I'll, this, is, this is my honest answer, all right? I'm going to commit to this. Ready? Mm -hmm. I think the coolest thing since I've been here that we've been able to see and do is we're getting much better at getting DNA out of the specimens. And that was just always, since I started being a biologist, that was always a big dream of mine to work in a place where we could, we could uh, work on doing that and developing methods for that. So that's my answer. And that's effectively, I guess, really deepening our understanding of, of amphibian and reptile diversity. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, it's, it's unlocking a massive amount of information from all of these specimens because there are these, you know, there are these data points frozen in time, I think, as John already mentioned, that's just, you know, if you're thinking about evolutionary genetics, it's just a very exciting time to be doing work. Great stuff. That was very convincing. I, I wholeheartedly oh, you. believe you. Um, what about you, John? 
Um, I feel people want me to say the giant squid being delivered, but it's not. Um, I mean, oh. you know, having the giant squid was amazing, so and good. I love her very dearly. Um, but I don't know. For me, probably was on a field trip uh, to Vietnam in 2013, where we found a species of snail, Bertia cambodiensis, uh, that was believed to be extinct. Um, it was recorded as extinct in the 1890s. Uh, and we found it, it's still alive today, and we've set up a breeding program with London Zoo and releasing them back into the wild. Okay, yeah. that, that is a good story. And how, how nice to kind of discover something that we thought was potentially lost forever. Yeah. So that's why it's very important to keep sending you out on these trips so you can cut stuff open and, <laughs> <laughs> and have great food on ships. <laughs> well, thank you so much to the both of you for joining us, Jeff and John. It's been a lot of fun speaking to you. And thank you as well to Fred Rumsey for taking us behind the scenes and showing us those amazing plant specimens. Most importantly, thank you to you for watching, for sending through your comments and great questions. If you enjoyed the show, which I really hope you did, please do share it with your friends. Uh, and you can catch up with old episodes of NHM Live on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, do keep following us on the usual social media channels. But for now, we hope to see you soon. Thank <laughs> you.